Chapter 31. Subject, Fleet Leader Barolin Onaya. Ship, RSV Nolbaranil Majestic in flight. Location, Regara. Order 316.04, 51 LGS. Fleet Leader Barolin Onaya is to report to United Systems Diplomatic Office aboard the Galactic Diplomacy Station in the Regara system for assessment by United Systems Artificial Intelligence John. Further orders will be given once the results of the assessment are evaluated. May the suns be with you, Onaya. From High Commander Uliriona, I couldn't believe my eyes. I hadn't even realized my own candidacy. I read the message again, and the knot that had been forming in my gut grew tighter, a mixture of excitement and nerves. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but also a massive amount of responsibility. I thought about calling Admiral Hecate for advice, but decided against it. He was likely chosen as well, and as such would be in very much the same nest as I. I read the message again as our shuttle finished the docking procedures. Welcome aboard the Galactic Diplomacy Station, Fleethead, the shuttle pilot said warmly. Careful, I softly chided. The proper rank is fleet leader. Most of us don't mind, but all it takes is one. Yes, sir, the pilot nodded. Good luck, fleet leader. Luck. I wonder which would be luckier, being chosen or declined. If I'm chosen, there's an opportunity for honor. My family will certainly be proud of me for my part in what's to come. It's not as if being declined will get me out of fighting this battle either. On the other talon, getting declined would mean that it wouldn't be my fault if we were to lose. Every chance for honor and glory comes with an equal chance for dishonor and shame. I cleared my throat and stepped off the shuttle. I was immediately met by a familiar face. Hello, fleet leader, Ambassador Eulina saluted. I hope you forgive me, but when I heard you'd be coming aboard, I had to stop by. Eulina! I clicked my beak happily, returning his salute. It's been ages. Are you well? I've heard nothing but good things. That's certainly not true, Ulina laughed. Accidentally dragging an alien race into our war with the machines had to have made some people upset. True enough, I suppose, I said as we began to walk to my destination. How's your family been? My sister is well, and as you know, my father likes to keep his distance, Eulina said with a sly smile. I've heard he's been doing well, though. Same with my mother and other siblings back home. That's good to hear. How has the life of a diplomat been treating you? Well enough, but if I'm being completely honest, I definitely prefer combat. Same nerves, but it seems less reasonable to be nervous in this position. Makes me feel weak. I suppose it would, but you must realize that the nerves are there for a reason. There's a lot riding on diplomacy at the moment, so it makes sense that your hearts are beating faster. Only a complete fool wouldn't be at least a little anxious in your position. Yes, fleet leader. How has your crew been holding up? They're a bit more thrilled at our new assignment than I am, especially the pay increase. The new crew members have been fitting in well, too. I nodded sadly. The shiphead had lost a good portion of his crew in the OU ambush that led to our current situation. How about you? He asked. Are you nervous about your assignment? Of course, I admitted with a wink. For one thing, I'm not entirely certain that I trust these AI. I don't exactly have a reason to distrust them, but they're different enough from us that I can't help but be wary. I've decided to go with the breeze for now, though. Is it true that the U.S. Embassy has gutted all their equipment to make sure the AI can fit in their systems? They returned the equipment that we donated to them and installed their own. But it wasn't just because of the AI. Their machines are much more efficient than ours, and their personnel are not used to our equipment. The engineers are thrilled that the power draw has decreased. Have they expressed any concern about the AI aboard the station? Truth be told, I don't exactly know all of the engineers personally. I'm simply repeating what I've been told, Ulina shrugged. There are probably some engineers aboard the station that are nervous about the AI. I've even heard a couple of pilots discussing a potential conspiracy between the OU and the USAI. They seem to think that the USAI and the OU are plotting to bring us all together in one location so the OU can destroy us easier. I laughed. If only they knew how close we were to extermination to begin with. All it would have taken is for one ship to have jumped home during a fight. My feathers quake at the thought. Indeed, Ulina replied somberly. We approached my destination and I turned to face him. This is my stop, I said. It's been a pleasure to see you. You as well, fleet leader. Good luck.
I watched Yulina walk away for a moment, then turned to the door. It was metal, like all the other doors aboard the station. It could even pass for one of the doors aboard the RSV Nolbaranil. The only real difference was the markings. Writing that indicated that the room was for the usage of the United Systems was directly below an upturned triangle containing several geometrically aligned shapes and an eye. The eye had a carefully crafted neutrality to it, so why was such an ominous aura emanating from it? I took a deep breath and stepped forward. The door slid open and I stepped inside the room. There was a single chair facing a table with a holographic emitter and a terminal. There was also a window looking out into space. I sat in the chair and gazed out the window, admiring the beauty of the void. After a moment, a hologram of a humanoid figure in United Systems armor appeared. Hello, Fleet Leader Berylin Onaya. I am USAI John, and I will be conducting an evaluation to determine your role in the upcoming assault against the Omni Union, it said. I understand. Then we'll begin. John gestured at the display, and it began showing my service record. During the majority of your time as a fleet leader, you have been in command of the Yenori fleet. This fleet is typically comprised of one million vessels. In your first engagement with the Omni Union, you suffered more than a 25% casualty rate. Considering that you did not know about the OU warp tracking capability, nor their xenocidal intent, why did you not order a retreat after sustaining 250,000 casualties. The question hit me like a stun baton. This artificial intelligence was going for my throat with a question designed to shake me to my core and cause me to doubt my command capabilities. The incident in question was the first and last time that the Yenori Rattling Blades fleet had been so badly damaged. I had lost so many soldiers over the course of that battle. It lasted several days and had very nearly broken my spirit. There had been many closed doors meetings afterward, but in the end, I was heralded as a hero. I felt that wasn't fair to those who died, but high command had deemed it necessary. They actually rounded down the casualties, I replied. We lost 283,492 vessels during that battle. I see, that's not... Regardless, there were multiple reasons that I didn't order a retreat, I interrupted. While we didn't know for certain, there were suspicions that the Omni Union had been following our ships home. We had also suffered quite a string of defeats, and we were in desperate need of a win. Above all that, though, my pride as a commander couldn't take it. We suffered those casualties so quickly that I barely had any time to react, and I convinced myself that if I ordered a retreat, the morale of my fleet would never recover. I now know how foolish I was to think that, but I am somewhat vindicated by the results of our victory. In what way? John asked. The Republic used our victory to bolster the morale of the other fleets. I lost a quarter of our forces, true, but I won. An untested fleet leader had beat the Omni Union. That's the story that they fed the media and the other fleet leaders. This led to more victories against the OU, and the battle has since been called a turning point in the war. I understand. Moving on, you were given command of a combined fleet and assigned to the defense of Saul. During this, you ordered your ships to form firing lines instead of skirmishing with the enemy. If it had not been for the fortunate timing of the FTLD patch, your forces would have been vulnerable to flanking fire. Explain why you chose this formation. My heart throbbed in my chest as my anger rose at the AI's brash, questioning tactics. However, I'm certain that's what it is trying to accomplish. When you imply incompetence, those that are competent will explain away your implications. Those that are truly incompetent will lash out instead. I carefully took a deep breath and thought out my response. We had been informed of the faster-than-light drive patch before the beginning of the battle. Once the OU's warp disruptors were no longer effective against your ships, my ships were vastly outclassed. As such, I had my ships form lines to serve as bait for the OU. This course of action was agreed upon by your own Admiral Hecate, who ordered the ships under his command to hunt down the OU ships that took the bait. A shrewd decision, John nodded slowly. I will acknowledge that you are a fine commander, one worthy of the many commendations and awards that you have received. I have only one more question relating to the most important attribute of anyone who is given command over others. Fleet Leader Onaya, are you willing to sacrifice your life and all of the ships under your command to defeat the Omni Union? 
This interview was just one shock after another. I had been expecting a similar question to this, but to hear it put so bluntly gave me pause. I thought about Hindel, Salin, and the rest of the men and women aboard the Nolbarinil. I thought of our families, my wife and son, forced to continue through life without me to support them. Then, I thought of the million ships that contained almost countless personnel whose families would suffer a similar fate. Or, they would all be mercilessly slaughtered by the Omni Union. Absolutely, I said. Chapter 32, Subject BI-41, Ship, BI-41, Location Oros, Form up and prepare for subspace travel. IRV 212's voice echoed within me. The Mualtan call this form of communication psychic, and as such the system is named Sinet, but that's not how it works at all. One simply thinks of speaking, and instead of one's mouth moving, a machine is activated that sends a transmission. Perhaps they're referring to the receptacle, but even that's not quite accurate. The transmission receptacle works in the same way that ears do, but much more efficiently and without the need for air as a vector. The inaccuracy of the name bothers me. Sign it, as if we are beings with telepathic or telekinetic abilities. Ridiculous. We are just a more efficient version of the biological machines that we started out as. Flesh into metal, synapses into circuits, blood into fuel and oil. Despite the teachings of the church, we are neither gods nor their heralds, and there is no one more knowledgeable of this fact than we. There is an immense amount of pain awaiting those that dare to begin the journey into becoming a Puanti, pain that cannot be managed by any means. Narcotics, hypnosis, and meditation can only hope to keep one sane in the face of the torment that the procedure entails. It takes a will of steel to become steel. This unavoidable pain is a byproduct of one being literally broken and built back up. Once the process is complete, most are fooled into feeling invincible. Godlike, even. This feeling lasts right up until you have your first malfunction. Then you realize you are simply less fragile than before. We are not even immune to the effects of time. We have simply traded decades for millennia. I fired my thrusters to match our small fleet's alignment, activated my faster-than-light drive, and verified the coordinates. This situation was even more evidence of our fallibility. The Church had taught us all that the galaxy was ours, and we were the only sentience within it. Of course, there was scientific dissent, but as we began our journey through the stars, the Church's dogma began to look more and more credible. Traveling to dozens of systems without finding even so much as an amoeba lulled us into a false sense of security. Then we encountered the Omni Union. At first, the Church claimed that they were extragalactic invaders, but then we encountered the Republic and United Systems. The Church has been scrambling to adjust the dogma even as the rest of us prepare for war. At least these days, they will admit when they are wrong, as long as they are proven to be so beyond a shadow of a doubt. There was a time not too long ago when questioning the church would be one of the fastest ways to commit suicide. Do you think we will survive? BL-28, my protege, asked. I have very little reason to believe otherwise, I answered. BL-28, formerly known as Renvira Adkur, is currently undergoing the procedure to become a Puanti. Even now, she is wearing a specially designed suit that slowly replaces her flesh and bones with machines. She is aboard my ship so that she may learn from me, but there have been challenges. The pain occasionally grips her focus away from my lessons, and her brain has not yet undergone full conversion. For this reason, I have created a special terminal for her that allows her to view a transcription of the Senate. This allows her to gain a better understanding of the context of my actions. I am far from the only Puanti that takes on students, but most do not. Some believe that one mustn't be guided through life like a child. Some cannot handle the grief when a protege succumbs to the procedure, and others are simply lazy and prefer solitude. I greatly enjoy both teaching and companionship, so taking on proteges comes naturally to me. BL-28 has been with me for three of the five years that she has been undergoing the process. I genuinely hope that she survives it. Most don't, and my mechanical form has carved their names and designations on the walls of my ship form. Engage faster than light drives in three, two, one. As the counter hit zero, I engaged my FTLD, and we entered subspace. Our destination is an alien system ruled by the United Systems to integrate with an allied military force. 
ZBC 446 had been kind enough to share their knowledge of the U.S. with the rest of us, and I had found myself somewhat in awe. A federation of beings that did not shed their flesh, yet managed to become much more advanced than we are in most fields of technology. We exited warp surrounded by their ingenuity, stations that held entire colonies of people, ships that were designed for peak efficiency, and weapons that we hadn't even dreamed of yet. The ships were of intensely variable size, hinting that they each had their own function that contributed to the whole of the fleet. There were small ships obviously designed to ferry people to and fro, larger ships that were slightly smaller than my own, and ships that dwarfed anything in our own fleet. I knew from my briefing that these were the United Systems battleships, carriers, and dreadnoughts. The battleships were much larger than our own, but that was to be expected from a weapons platform with a need for a biological crew. Their carriers were more bulbous than the battleships, but still efficiently designed for their intended purpose. The dreadnoughts, though, seemed excessive. The battleships had obviously been designed to equip as many weapon systems as possible. The carriers were designed with their cargo in mind. These immense cone-shaped entities that exceeded the size of any creation that I've ever seen were built around a singular weapon. A weapon that can allegedly destroy a planetary entity. If I hadn't already been briefed on it, I would be completely awestruck. I immediately began to wonder about other fields of technology and how advanced they are in them. There are many assumptions one can make, but for every justification, the opposite is true as well. Advanced weapons may mean advanced medicine, but it could also mean advanced armor instead. Technological discoveries typically follow necessity, but sometimes these discoveries occur in the pursuit of other knowledge. As such, there is no real path to technology without gross oversimplification. As I was practicing this lecture that I may give BL-28 later on, my communicator pinged. This communicator is a necessity to speak to those who still have mouths, but it had been a very long time since I'd last used it. I opened a channel and waited. Greetings, I am Admiral Bakir, and I will be leading this strike group, a voice said over the communicator. I am sure you have already been briefed, but it is imperative that we avoid any miscommunications and know our roles in the upcoming battle. Our goal is simple. Destroy as many mobile prime platforms as we can. A lofty goal, BL-28 said sarcastically. Indeed, now hush, I replied. Some of you may believe this to be a fool's errand, but we have already destroyed several of them, the U.S. Admiral continued. You will receive orders to join a strike team. Most strike teams will consist of three dreadnoughts, whose job is to kill the mobile prime platforms. Other strike teams are dedicated to occupying and harassing Omni-Union forces in other systems to distract them from reinforcing the MPPs. Each strike team will be led by a commander who has already created a chain of command within your team. You will be receiving a data packet that contains your chain of command, as well as other information pertaining to this mission. Follow your orders and get the job done. Bakir, out. A data packet was immediately transferred once the communicator went silent. I ran a standard security scan, not that I would have been able to detect any malware from a civilization with artificial intelligence, and opened the packet. As I suspected, I am indeed one of the lucky ones that gets to accompany a dreadnought. I am attached to Strike Team 14, which is led by Fleet Leader Onaya of the Republic, and there are only five others of my kind on the team. I wondered at the point of including us in these strike teams to begin with. Of the four allied governments, the Puanti have the fewest ships. The weapons and shields of our ships are somewhat more advanced than that of the Republic, but nowhere near the potential capabilities of the United Systems. I wonder if they know how closely we were paying attention to their defense of us. I thought we were going to join the swarm, BL-28 interrupted my musings. Truly? I believe there is a political component to our inclusion on this strike team, I explained. The United Systems might be trying to impress upon us that we are an important part of this alliance so that we may look favorably upon them in the future. Are they truly so advanced as to look down on us like that? Absolutely. According to the data given to Unit ZBC 446, the United Systems military has advanced to the point of destroying entire stars. One does not advance that far militarily without also advancing other fields of technology as well. 
As with all potential enemies, they are not to be underestimated. I understand, but do you know why they're only fielding 33 strike teams? Haven't they made 198 dreadnoughts already? That's enough for 66 strike teams. I assume it is so that they can maintain a steady momentum during the assault. Half attacking, half in reserve to fill any gaps. At first glance, it seems to be a rather two-dimensional way of thinking. But being able to reinforce one's losses on the fly gives one a massive advantage in warfare. BL-28's ignorance of strategy is easily forgivable. I like to consider myself a student of war, but the truth is that the Puanti rarely go to war, and it is even less common among the Mualtan. It has been centuries since I've seen a large-scale conflict. It's rather obvious that this is not the case for the United Systems, though. One of our concerns with cooperation had been how difficult it would be to logistically field so many different fleets and commanders in one operation, but the United Systems had taken charge and accomplished this monumental task with ease. How smoothly everything had been going could be attributed to luck, but it was far more likely to be due to practice. I would very much like to review their history if I should ever get the chance. Join with your strike teams. IRV 212's voice entered my mind once again. Henceforth, we will be using audio communications to avoid miscommunication with the organic components of our forces. Good luck, and may the circuitry guide you to enlightenment. I registered amusement as I fired my engines and thrusters to comply. Unit IRV-212 is a rarity among the Puanti, a true believer in the mechanical singularity. He is also a competent commander, which is why we chose him to lead us in this war before we realized the extent of our alliance with the aliens. This is likely the shortest term a Puanti fleet commander has ever had. I took my position with the rest of my strike team, hovering relatively close to those of my kind. I wasn't the only one. The rest of the ships in the strike team had grouped themselves in a similar manner. Ancient urgings toward familiarity shine through our supposed advancement. I am fleet leader Berylin Onaya, a voice sounded over the communicator. Welcome to strike team 14. Our dreadnoughts will be targeting one of the MPPs that will be in the system that we are jumping to. The rest of us will do everything we can to assist. We will start with offensive action against any Omni Union ships we come across, and will adapt as necessary as the situation develops. There will be other strike teams in the same system with us, so be certain to verify your target acquisitions and firing solutions to avoid friendly fire. Prepare your FTLDs to engage on my mark. My comrades within the strike team attempted to speak to me, but I ignored them. As a student of war, I know that there's no benefit to anything they can say now. Each of us will have to face what's coming, and no word spoken now will change that. I will do my duty. They will do their duty. We will make them Walton proud, or cease our useless existences. Mark, Onaya said, 